U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is touring four Central and Eastern European countries. Criticizing China and Russia appears to be high on the agenda. His focus will be on Russia's Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, Huawei, and 5G, as well as the redeployment of U.S. troops pulled from Germany. What role does Central Europe play in current U.S. strategies? Will it become a front line of international power politics again? And what do European countries have to say about all of this? To discuss these issues and more, I'm joined by Feng Zhongping, Vice President of the China Institute of Contemporary International Relations, also by Mark Slabada, Moscow-based international affairs and security analyst, Michael O'Hallen, security fellow, senior fellow and director of research from the Brookings Institution, and Professor G. W. Kolotko from Kosminski University, and author of China and the Future of Globalization, is based in Warsaw. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan. Um, you know, Vice Chairman Feng, let me go to you first. Uh, Mike Pompeo has visited the Central and Eastern European countries uh, multiple times. Uh, what's on his agenda this time around? Well, I, I think a lot of people are talking about the transatlantic relations, especially during the you know Trump's administration. Uh, as far as China-U.S. relations is you know it's getting more difficulties. Uh, uh, I, I imagine, you know, uh, uh, the, um, Mike Pompeo, U.S. Secretary of State, you know, you know, was to uh, 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 ask European countries to probably take the uh, uh, American side, you know, in order to you know, attempt to, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 isolate China, if you like, or isolate Russia. The, uh, but the, my point is, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is no, uh, you know, uh, one single Europe. Uh, 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 even the U United States, you, you know, uh, uh, their views, their views, their policy towards China, towards Russia is different from that of the United States. They have some common interests, common views, but not all the same. So. Uh, and China is, has been regarded by many European countries, including Central European countries, as a, a, a partner, not only in the economic areas, but in other areas as well. For example, uh, 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 climate change issues and other global uh, 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 governance issues. So um, I, I, I don't think, you know, uh, you know, Pompeii's trip in Central Asia will, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know uh, 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 get what he wants. Well, let's ask you know, some of the, these host countries about whether Pompeo can get what he wants. Um, Professor Kolotko, based in, in Poland, uh, you yourself were a senior official in Poland. Do you think uh, Mike Pompeo will be able to uh, sell, if you will, his anti-China China mindset? I'm afraid that in Poland it would be easier to raise uh, anti-Russian uh, sentiment Russophobia, which unfortunately uh, is flying r relatively high in my country. And as far as uh, our relations with China are concerned, I believe that the government is rather pragmatic and it's not just following the uh, dictum from Washington how to act. Yet, due to the American blackmail, um, that if we want, I mean the Polish government, because definitely that is the wrong policy movement, to redeploy American forces, some of them being taken from Germany on the Polish soil, and it was said officially by the American leaders, including President Trump, that if we will accept 5G technology, the American troops will be not deployed in my country. And the right-wing post-solidarity government is so much ill-advised and committed to have more American soldiers in Poland that uh, they will comply with this uh, anti-Chinese uh, wishes uh, requirements of the Trump administration. But first things first, you know, in the three months time, and times go pretty fast, We'll be already after the presidential election, and uh, by all means, we'll have the new president uh, in place of um, this misfortune of Mr. Trump. And I think that 
the policy will start to uh, change, to be more balanced. So I'm seeing this Mr. Pompeo visit as one more strike during the presidential campaign of Mr. Trump and his administration prior to the forthcoming election. And I think that each and every, each Central European country, including Poland, which is the most important because it is the biggest, the largest, the strongest economy doing relatively well during this calamity of COVID-19, that we will put it on hold and we'll wait until after November election because there is the expectation that the policy right. of U.S. under the new presidency will be uh -huh. more pragmatic, more rational, and not as lousy and um, wrong as it has been. Well, you know what? I want to turn to recently. our guest in Moscow. Mark, um, welcome to Dialogue, first of all. Um, why do you think Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo picked Austria, Czech Republic, Poland, and Slova uh, Slovenia? Okay, well, first of all, these four Central and East European states all right now have nationalist populist elements, uh, either in their president's office and their prime ministers, or very strong elements in their society. It has uh, long been a characteristic of uh, Trump administration's foreign policy to seek out politically like-minded states in Europe, and I think that's one of the first priorities. Um, the other primary addition to that would be Hungary, of course, but Hungary is not playing ball with the U.S.'s ban on Hawaii. So uh, they have not yet been included uh, in, in this select group, although there was outreach uh, from the administration to Hungary uh, commenting on how uh, good the relations are uh, and they hope to make progress on that issue. But Mark, the do you see these countries having we, their security and economic interests uh, totally aligned with those of the U.S.? Um, I, it has long been uh, established that in Central and Eastern Europe, which was termed New Europe uh, by Donald Rumsfeld back in the George W. Bush administration, that there is a greater penchant among Central and East European states to align their foreign policies in a more client-state relationship with the United States more often than, say, their Western European counterparts. Well, talking about old Europe and new Europe, I want to show you what our, some of our viewers uh, have just said on the Internet. Uh, this, uh, you know, Twitter user, Untouchable, said, interesting to see that Pompeo is not visiting Paris and Berlin. He prefers to say hello to Eastern Europe, Europe friends, remembering Donald Rumsfeld, stating old and new Europe. Time is repeating. Uh, Vice President Fung, do you see it that way, too? You know, uh, uh Certainly, uh, you know, I'm thinking about what the U.S. Uh, administration, Trump administration, what they have in their hand. When, you know, when the Secretary of State visits these uh, Central European countries, Eastern European countries, I think they, they try to use the Russia factor, you know, or you, if you like as a security factor. Uh, you know, China is, not, uh, uh, is far away from uh, uh, Europe, uh, including Central Europe. Uh, so. Uh, and uh, China is a very important, you know, uh, economic partner for many European countries, including Central East, Eastern European countries. So, uh, you know, what is the, you know, something, you know, you, you, you US can sell in Europe, in Central Europe, in order to win this country's support for, you know, for the war, for this uh, battles, uh, you know, with China or, or Russia, if you like. So, uh, security factor is probably a, a one very useful factor, uh, uh, as far as I say, you know, uh, because uh, as our uh, Polish colleague has just mentioned, uh, in, you know, uh, uh, some Central European countries regarded Russia as a, 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 a threat, you know, a, a, a potential uh, a, a important threat, security threat. So uh, that's why they think, you know, uh, has a member, membership of NATO has a strong uh, uh, security allies with Washington D.C. is critical for their uh, country. So, so uh, you, that will make this country very difficult uh, to not, you know, refuse mm -hmm. to uh, 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 stand together with uh, with the U.S. administration. Uh, having said that, you know, I think we all know 
upcoming U.S. elections. So this is an emerging factor. Uh, I think policymakers, European, uh, Central Euro European countries, government, they will, they will know this. So uh, when, uh, when the, you know, the new government came to, into power, if the, uh, uh, Joe Biden win the election, probably you know, the situation will be different. As far as the uh, you know, Western European concerned, uh, Paris and other, uh, uh, you know, Berlin has been concerned. I think this country do, uh, has not have not considered Russia as uh, a threat as you know the, uh, some Central European countries has been mm -hmm. you know uh, thinking. Well, you know, uh, Professor Kolovko uh, in Warsaw uh, talking about economic cooperation. Do you think Pompeo's message that uh, Huawei is a dangerous partner? Uh, it's 5G, cannot be trusted, uh, will sell in Poland. Well, I was uh, in for Polish government's deputy prime minister, minister of finance, and uh, my agenda was uh, always very much long-term oriented and pragmatic, and I wish that the, uh, each Polish uh, government will follow the Shoot, the Polish economic situation is relatively good compared to any other country in the region and beyond. But uh, the name of the game is to find a balance within the European Union, of which we are the core member, the biggest of all the new members from East Central Europe. But also we want to have as good as possible relations with, Germ with the United States. And sometimes there are contradictory forces involved in this game and the U.S. under the Trump administration is playing this gate to the, to the Which American Which force hands. is prevailing uh, right now in Poland? Pro-China or pro-U.S. Well, if you can simplify it that way. The current government is extremely pro-American and they will follow these suits and I'm afraid that they will much, uh, they have much more ear to listen to Mr. Pompeo and Mr. Trump then say to the Brussels politicians or French president on Germany uh, chancellor. But definitely Poland is not, uh, is not xenophobic, it's not a, a turn against China. And you have to see the Pompeo visit also within the context of 16, now 17 plus one initiative of which 17 countries, Poland is the biggest one, and uh, aside of Greece, which joined recently, the 16 East European countries, these are so-called post-communist countries, which joined uh, mostly, of most of them, NATO and the European Union. And somehow recently, also because of COVID-19 pandemic, China is less active towards this bold trade, uh, inclusive uh, cooperation, globalization mm -hmm. and infrastructure project. So I would take a look how much and to what extent the, the, the Pompeo visit to East Central Europe is to weaken the, uh, the agenda of 17 plus 1, because this is another structural program which must be seen within the context of irreversible globalization, which may enforce and improve economic and non-economic relations between East Central European countries and uh, China, and I don't see it is contradictory to deepening and furthering the European uh, integration, but uh, Pompeo is here to, uh, to put the wedge between Western Europe and Eastern Europe to make a little bit more problem in the European Union after our success when we have agreed recently to run 750 billion euro joint project to find the uh, implications, consequences of COVID-19 and so on. So my advice to whatever government, the Americans, they don't listen because they believe that they know best, uh, better than anybody else, which uh, is not true, is to stay the course, be pragmatic and to look uh, to East. Uh, we are the member of the West, definitely each and every country Mr. Pompeo is visiting. We became during class generation the Western countries being for couple of generations, so-called Eastern countries, but uh, to have the better, the best possible relations, economic and uh, political one with Russia, with China, and with everybody else to the East mm -hmm. would be a wise, wise policy. Well, Mark, uh, in Moscow, let me go to you. Um, how do you think Moscow and Kremlin would see all this, uh, that Pompeo is visiting these four Central and Eastern European countries? 
uh, because historically they used to be the Russian sphere of influence. <laughs> Well, I think that uh, Russia has much very realistic uh, conception of its geopolitical horizons uh, and how reduced they are since the days of the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union. And the Russian government does not view adversely uh, U.S. relations with Eastern Europe. It does not find a, an implicit threat there except for the placement of U.S. troops in Eastern Europe on Russia's borders. That is what the Kremlin has a problem with. Well, we understand that we have Michael O'Hallen from Brooklyn Institu Institution. Um, hopefully we will have him in a little bit. Um, Vice Chairman Feng, uh, let me ask you this. Um, you know, it's also big on the agenda, uh, in fact, that energy security will also be talked about. Uh, you know, in Central Europe's um, gas uh, Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline to connect Russia and Germany. Uh, it is near completion. Uh, what does the U.S. have to say about all this? How is Russia, uh, you, you, do you, in your opinion, uh, looking at all this? I cannot uh, clearly hear you, what you say, but uh, uh, I, I think you, you, you want to ask me to about the uh, northern... The role of, let's put it simply, the role of Russia uh, in all this, because all these four Central and Eastern European countries used to be Russian sphere of influence. Mm. Well, I think, you know, uh, your, your, uh, uh, Central European countries, uh, this, this region is certainly uh, is a place which... Uh, 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 three powers, I think, European Union uh, as a whole, uh, including, you know, uh, uh, Western European countries uh, uh, and the United States and Russia. You know, three powers are, are considered this area is extremely important for them. You know, uh, some years ago we saw the uh, EU expansion eastward and NATO ex uh, expansion eastward and uh, we say, you know, uh, uh, Russia's influence has been dramatically reduced in this region, but, but, but this region used to be the very important play, a part of the, you know, Russia's influence. So uh, uh, this kind of uh, struggling for influence is, uh, has remained, uh, you know, the same, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so I think, you know, uh, countries like Germany uh, will consider their own interest. For example, as far as mm -hmm. the gas pipeline is concerned, the Germany consider and other European, Western European countries, including Italy, consider their energy sovereignty, energy uh, security is a sovereignty issue. You know, which which should be dictated, not by others but by themselves. You know, uh, 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 yesterday or today, uh, the the German foreign minister had a meeting in Moscow with his counterpart, uh, uh, Russia foreign minister. And uh, I saw their uh, news conference, uh, press conference, you know, the statement by two foreign ministers, Russian foreign ministers and the German foreign minister. Clearly, I got the sense, you know, uh, 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 Germany would not, would not let their own interest, any, uh, energy security interest, being dictated by the United States, you know. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so it's interesting to say how this will work out, you know, uh, among the three powers. European Union uh, 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 as a whole. You know what, uh, Vice President Feng, it's interesting you talk about European Union um, because that's what I want to ask Mark about. Uh, how do you see the role of European Union? Do you think the EU is totally on board with uh, you know, America's strategy to increase its influence in Central and Eastern Europe? Mark? Uh, well, certainly as a unified measure, absolutely not. Uh, in fact, many European analysts and politicians have talked about the divisive role that the U.S. is playing, specifically to draw, try and draw a divide between Eastern and Western Europe and use that as uh, leverage against Brussels uh, and, and particularly against Berlin. And a big issue there, of course, is the issue of Nord Stream, where the, shall we say, the, the longer standing and more dominant countries of the European Union are solidly in support of Nord Stream as a necessary uh, energy pipeline to secure their energy security needs, whereas the Eastern European countries are being specifically um, cultivated 
by the United States and used as a wedge against uh, Berlin and Brussels on this issue. Well, I understand that we have Michael O'Hallen, senior fellow from Brookings Institution. Uh, welcome, Michael. How do you see the significance of Mike Pompeo's visit to Central and Eastern Europe? What does he want to achieve? Well, I think the previous analysis was good, but I also think this is a matter of sort of tradition that Pompeo is Secretary of State now just perhaps for a few more months. And it makes sense that he continue to visit parts of the world that are unified with the United States in trying to establish a robust military deterrent against Russia. And also, of course, with President Trump deciding to pull forces out of Germany and put some of them into Eastern Europe, there is an additional military dimension uh, that needs to be discussed and essentially completed. So uh, I don't really like the Trump administration's foreign policy towards Europe. But I think that some of this can be viewed in very matter-of-fact terms. And uh, I do think since the Eastern European countries he's visiting uh, are generally already in NATO, that we need to be sure that we are firm in our military commitments and obligations to them, even if I was a skeptic about expanding NATO to those countries in the first place. Now that they are in NATO, it's important that Russia understand we will protect them if need be. And so I think mm -hmm. maintaining solidarity with those countries is actually a good thing. Well, Michael, um, do you think the idea that uh, you know, Huawei is bad and 5G from China is dangerous, that idea that rhetoric uh, will be sold uh, across these four Central and Eastern European countries by Pompeo? You know, uh, we'll let those countries decide for themselves. The United States feels strongly about this issue, as you know. And it's not just the Trump administration. President Trump, as you know, is unique on some issues. For example, his, his spat with Angela Merkel and his decision to pull a third of U.S. forces out of Germany, that was sort of all about Donald Trump. But the idea of strengthening the U.S. commitment to Eastern Europe and the idea of opposing uh, the spread of Huawei's 5G network, these ideas are actually much more common and popular across many American strategists of both political parties. And so I think the United States will make that sort of an effort. I think a Biden administration would make that sort of an effort. Uh, but of course, those countries will have to decide for themselves how to try to get along with both China and the yeah, United States. Yeah, but Michael, States these countries possible. have historical and uh, still strong ties economically uh, with China. Sure, and they have strong security ties with the United States. And so let's hope for the sake of these countries, they can find some way to preserve good relations with both. Uh, but, you know, they're also going to have to choose to some extent that at a time when China and Russia are sometimes seen as representing a bit of a strategic block, does the European, you know, uh, Union or Eastern European members of NATO, do they really benefit from being in a situation where we think they have vulnerabilities to China? And, uh, and so that's the case the United States will be making. Uh, I have no idea what the individual countries will decide. Well, um, Mr. Feng, let me go to you. You know, redeployment of troops is big on the agenda. Pompeo talked about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the recently completed U.S.-Poland enhanced the defense cooperation agreement uh, that, quote unquote, provides a framework to further strengthen the transatlantic security. Uh, why do you think Poland is so willing to invite U.S. troops and strengthen military ties with the U.S.? Good question uh, for our Polish friends to to answer, but uh, as far as I say this question uh, in Beijing, I, I think, you know, uh, uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, uh, colleagues, friends in Poland, I, I ask them, you know, the same question you asked me many times. Uh, uh, you know, I was, uh, 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 I was told, you know, uh, although uh, uh, many countries uh, does not like, uh, do not like uh, Trump administration, but they think many, many people in the, uh, particularly the uh, officials, uh, government people in Poland think Trump administration is actually can uh, a pledge to defend Poland in case, in case of uh, uh, some, you know, uh, foreign invas invasions. I think, in, you know, uh, 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 let's think about the uh, 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 Crimea uh, crisis. Uh, 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 I think the, uh, in 2014 probably is a, a turning point in, uh, in, in terms of uh, Polish uh, attitudes towards Russia 
and the Polish uh, views, uh, uh, you know, about the uh, uh, whole European security architecture, uh, particularly regarding the NATO as the, uh, you know, the cornerstone. Uh, uh, so uh, I think, you know, uh, they want to really uh, uh, get the support from the NATO, uh, but, uh, you know, to have a permanent station of U.S. troops right. is, 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 is another thing. You know, uh, because this uh -huh. is so opposite to the, the, the you know, the, the, the treaty between NATO and Russia back to 80s. Right. Uh, of course, security is an important uh, dimension, but there are also uh, such a thing as, you know, technology, 5G. Uh, over the years, Poland, Estonia and Czech Republic have signed agreements with the U.S. pledging that 5G suppliers would not be subject to companies without independent judicial review. Uh, which, um, you know, effectively excludes Chinese firms. Uh, Pompeo will sign a joint declaration on 5G technology with the Slovenian foreign minister. Um, Mark, let me go to you. You're in the studio, uh, looking good. Uh, what are the incentives for some countries to ban Huawei while others don't? Okay, Mark. Um, Michael, why don't I go to you? Um, did you hear my question? Yes, and yes, I think please, go it's ahead. a fairly straightforward uh, choice, although it's a very difficult choice. China right now has the best and most affordable 5G network, and I have no doubt that most people who work with Huawei and most Chinese engineers uh, are very good and very serious about doing their job well and just want to do their job well. Uh, but then, of course, we have a broader strategic competition between the West and China that has military and strategic aspects and that has a lot of intelligence related dimensions to it that has a lot of concerns about cybersecurity and we have many examples of where we've already seen the two countries the United States and China in particular uh, be competitive with each other over this kind of issue and we know that China has engaged in a lot of cyber uh, intelligence gathering and some cyber theft of intellectual property and so in that kind of a context the United States of course is very concerned that adopting Chinese 5G with the Chinese government's ability to leverage whatever the Chinese corporate world is doing uh, based on the China uh, law that requires Chinese companies to cooperate with their government on national security matters, that this creates new vulnerabilities. So it's economic efficiency versus security vulnerability. And it's right. a trade-off that's very hard to actually assess. Michael, we have about uh, 45 seconds left. Uh, do you think this China-U.S. strategic competition contest, even confrontation, uh, will get, uh, you know, less severe uh, should there be another administration? Yes, and I think the article in Foreign Affairs magazine by Kurt Campbell and Jake Sullivan helps us see how a Biden administration could try to be a little more predictable and a little bit calmer about the U.S.-China relationship. However, we have to all appreciate that things have changed and that we won't be going back to anything like the relationship we had, let's say, in the early 2000s. So it's going to be a little bit more complicated, complex, and competitive, but it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it has to be adversarial, and I hope very much we can minimize the military and security risks, even if we compete in other mm -hmm. ways. Michael and Helen, Mark Slabadoda, Feng Zhongping, and Professor Kolota, thank you so much for your time. And that would do it for this edition of Dialogue. I'm Wang Guang in Beijing. Thank you so much for watching.